Welcome back to the library, dear wanderer. I am familiar with our little routine now. Pay no mind to the others in the shelves. It is a slow day, and all the patrons are looking for a story to delve into. They will not bother the chief archivist and his guest. Come, walk with me. I will take you to our spot, and regale you with some of the tomes of the library while you rest. Memoirs of a Ghost by Florida The first sense to return to me was the feeling of crust and dirt sealing my eyelids firmly shut. My face contorted in an effort to pry them open. When I finally managed to break the mucus seal, cold, sharp air hit my vulnerable eyes. Feeling slowly returned to my extremities as I blinked away the borderline painful feeling. My wits finally about me, I realized I was before a large group. Their muted murmurs rushed past my ears, quickly overwhelming me. I lifted my lead-laden arms to cover them, even for just a small moment of silence. Thick rope halts my movements, my hands and feet are bound behind me. I can feel the small cuts that the rough surface of the rope inflict on my wrists and ankles. The tiny fibers of it are able to find the minuscule wounds and dig their thin straw even deeper in. The pain halts my effort and I am forced to continue to kneel helplessly before the crowd and listen to the chatter slowly die. Several pairs of footsteps approach my position. The first and closest voice is one of the foreigners. He begins to speak, presumably addressing the crowd. I can feel him move and gesticulate wildly as he paces around me, growing increasingly agitated. I have always found their manner of speaking strange. But the way this man's voice pitches up and gradually becomes louder and more frantic sends the chill of dread down into my bones. The foreigner finishes his frantic speech with a phrase both familiar and dreaded. Viva Dios y viva nuestras amables maestades los reyes. Another, lighter set of footsteps approaches me and I can sense an individual kneel before me. Their hot breath kisses my face, and I am able to recognize them solely from the way their breathing picks up before they speak. My dearest and closest friend, almost akin to a brother. Almost. Please, Ueza, I need you to listen to me. I'm, I'm truly sorry for all of this, but I swear to you it will all be over soon if you just listen. His voice would appear carefully calm to anyone who couldn't understand him, almost as if he was simply reading my death rites. I spit at his feet. Mabo, you traitor son of a whore, I whisper. I will have none of your platitudes. He grunts in frustration. You wouldn't understand. I am doing what is necessary to keep us alive. These times will end as soon as we can just... I interrupt him. You fools who believe the promises of these scum are the ones who will put us all in our graves. There is a prolonged silence. The crowd begins to vocalize their discontent, so Mabo stands before sighing heavily and communicating something to the foreigner. He leans down once more to leave me with his final piece of advice. You've done this to yourself, you know. I can tell he doesn't even believe his own callous words. I have no more time to ponder this statement as a hand roughly yanks me back by my hair and pins me down, so I face the sky. Another hand comes to roughly caress my cheek. I squirm as it makes a sudden detour to my eye. I struggle and grunt as yet another, more foul-smelling hand comes to forcefully pry it open. I cannot see. I have never been able to see. Perhaps this is why, when the cold, sharp metal made contact, I screamed. I scream until my throat is raw and tears streak down the sides of my cheeks. I scream until a filthy rag is shoved down my throat as the knife continues its torturous journey deeper into my socket. Pain is the lashes the foreigners will inflict upon you for the slightest misbehavior. Pain is feeling your back ripped open and whipped raw until the meat and blood drips down your hips and you cannot breathe from the sheer agony of it all. Pain is feeling them shove their dirty fingers into the wound to tear and rip at your remaining skin. This was not pain. This was beyond pain. I am cold, yet I am unbelievably horrifically hot. Sensation disappears from my every limb as my body is forced to focus on the foreigner's ministrations. 
He slices into my sensitive flesh with the force of a man possessed. The process is by no means clean. The man with his hand buried in my scalp digs in his nails to tighten his grip. I barely notice until he forces me forwards into a sitting position. The force of the push forces the knife further into me and I can feel it scrape against something before I lose my bearings. When my senses return to me, I am hunched over with my hands still held behind me, wheezing shakily. My forehead touches the dirt below me as a variety of bodily fluids form a warm, disgusting puddle below. I sob, which only adds to the racking pain. The most peculiar thing, however, was the empty throbbing of my eye socket. The pain was excruciating indeed. But the emptiness, the air reaching places it was not supposed to, the feel of dust and dirt entering the wound as I ground my forehead into the earth in a desperate attempt for any kind of relief. It was undeniably worse. I barely registered when the foreigner began to speak again except to ponder how his voice was so far away, yet his hands were still in a vice grip against the back of my neck. It was not until another man spoke up to translate the end of the speech in his unstable voice that I realized. Long live God, and long live our gracious majesties, the king and queen. Mabo releases my neck, frantically wiping his blood-stained hands on my back. I feel something hot drip down my neck, and I find I still have the strength to shudder in disgust when I realize he weeps. He whispers to me, his voice is weak, and it quivers and breaks as he sobs and pleads. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, God, I'm sorry, please, Yuiza, I... I was allowed one mercy on this day. I didn't live long enough to hear the end of Mabo's pitiful attempts to soothe his own conscience. The Book of Rules, 5th edition by Lan 2D. Came across a stack of loose pages with a green cover in one of the defunct east-west wings. I've managed to assemble them into some kind of structure. The pages are a little charred, but fortunately it's readable. I don't know if you've gone through the old originals, but this copy significantly diverges from the one we have on record. Let me know what you think. The Book of Rules. Rule 1. Do not take what is not yours. This maxim rings true even now. It is not simply about stealing, it is about respect. Respect for one's fellow wanderer, respect for one's environment, respect for those who came before and those who will come after. It is not translatable to a mere do not snatch a book out of another's hands, as some may interpret it. It is as widely applicable as one wants and as flexible as one needs. Remember it because it pervades the essence of the library as much as the pursuit of knowledge. Do not waste another's time. Do not take a life. Do not take what is not yours. Rule two, keep your library card safe. If you are acquainted with the library, you will have been granted a library card, immortal and incorruptible. These cards cannot be forged and thus represent one's identity more so than a voice or a physical appearance which can be stolen by any number of deceitful sorcerers or mimics. As such, one's library card is the easiest method of identifying friend from foe, offering one's own card as a gesture of trust and peace between parties, whilst asking for another's card can be seen as accusatory. Choosing the latter option is advised in all cases to confirm the honesty of a person, especially in unfamiliar locations, especially now. If you see an ownerless library card, hide it on your person until the owner can be found. There are those who collect the cards of wanderers as trophies. They must not be granted any more rewards. Rule 3. Familiarize yourself with ways. Historically, the ways have acted as a gateway between realities. Attempts to enter the library by aggressors would be steered away through its labyrinth and network. Behind that first, quintessential layer are the members of library staff who, by their nature, know to protect the library and those within it. Behind even that remains an informal aegis provided by the wanderers themselves. 
Previously, Knox had been intuitive yet discreet, allowing only those wanderers with an honest desire for knowledge to enter. The ways had been flexible in size and shape as a tunnel is designed for a carriage, the ways themselves would morph to protect the users within. Even those with wicked intentions would be deposited safely, albeit outside the library's halls. Now, it is as if their language has been changed. They no longer listen to reason, to fact, to the pure intentioned or well-meaning. They do not listen at all. Rather, they shout demands and whisper secrets. They have become feral, like a web of intestines, digesting some, rejecting others. Similarly, the Nox once used to enter such ways are obsolete and should be forgotten. However, some things remain consistent. The familiar shimmer of a way exit, the seemingly incoherent, a priority knowledge of a clean knock being achieved. If one can recognize these things, one can learn to avoid them. But, like all things, this is easier said than done. There are those of us who had never left the library, never experienced the wonders that lie beyond the ways. Further, there are those of us who do not know this place's name or purpose because it is unessential to their way of life. Those who live beneath the sea of words, those whose ancestors wall walked to the paperless skies above the stacks, there are those who do not know the library is dying. I will not name these places or these peoples, but if you are familiar with these isolates, inform them that things are different. They must know to beware doorways and corners, to avoid shimmers and knocks. They must know that the ways are not safe to traverse and that the things that exit from the ways will be malformed and dangerous. If they do not know how to recognize a way, teach them. This paranoia will not last forever. Rule 4. Limit your possessions. Despite the library's diversity in both people and ecosystem, we all share one desire. Knowledge. Some may find shelter here, others seek community or friendship, but these functions are always going to be secondary, for better or worse. There is a reason we call it THE library. As you know, this culture is cemented into our minds, knowledge is sacred, and the stories narrated are more important than the person narrating. Abandon this notion now. In the burning of shelves up by down, I saw wanderers empty their bags of food to store more books. I watched, in awe, as they turned back into the smoke, attempting to save the precious tomes therein. Whilst it is true that knowledge is worth preserving, there is no knowledge more precious than one's life. This is the truth. The library has more books than one can imagine, or count for that matter. Limit yourself to five books on your person at most. There will always be an opportunity to gain more. The contents of these books are for your own choosing, though I recommend taking a variety of essentials. The library keeps a multitude of handbooks and guides from tying ropes or foraging for food to the arcane arts. Do not be afraid to discard a book if you have no need for it anymore. Do this not because it is written. Do it because, in this place, knowledge has permanence where you do not. There is no story without the storyteller. Rule 5. Stay clear of named places. In names, the danger lies. The first places the invaders will approach are ones that can be thought of, said aloud, communicated. Besides the main hall, which is constantly under siege and therefore immune to any further nominal lure I put out, places frequently talked about or with some mythology should be fled. The wordsmith's shore has been overrun by mercenaries, the perception area is now numb to the presence of evil, and the Glenmire glass house is in shards. Like the main hall, these will not suffer by further mention in this book, and similarly famous places are to be avoided. In the library, any place with any amount of literature on it will have been mapped and named, given a place within the library cosmos. It is only a matter of time before their literature is read, and they are found. However, there are exceptions to this rule, bastions against the heat, safe houses among the ashes. If you know these by name, you were already within them. If not, I am sorry, I cannot name them here. I have faith, as wanderers you are aware of the unnamed, seek refuge in these places and hide until a time comes when they are named too. Rule 6. Avoid library staff. 
I do not refer to the elected curators, nor to any volunteer librarians. I refer to the library's own staff, docents, pages, archivists. Any librarian that is born from within the shelves. Before the eve, they would listen to reason. Now they withdraw into the bowels of the library, disregarding their duties. Those that remain above should not be considered staff anymore. I have seen pages overturned collapsed shelves only to ignore those trapped underneath. I have witnessed docents act like diseased wolves, losing their stoic composure and ability to distinguish innocence from wrongdoers. Once, previously, when I still had faith in the soundness of their minds, I attempted to follow a group of pages into the tunnels beneath the stacks. I pursued far into the darkness, and, believing they were not aware of my presence, continued towards my destination. What I could only assume was their nest. The journey was tiresome, but I remember the walls clearly. When I initially brushed past them, I felt a distinct discordance. I stopped, inspected, and realized this was the feel of a million individual pages compressed together like some sedimentary stone. I tried to remove one to understand what kinds of books were buried here, but the paper was fixed in place. Soon after, the tunnel expanded into a large archway. The pages funneled through in succession, so once more I followed. However, as soon as I passed over the threshold, I felt the way pull me in, and suddenly I was standing in the main hall, dazed and alone. I believe, somehow, I had activated the knock unwillingly, lured into the archway by the pages. Since then, their presence in the library proper has become sparse, and I have not attempted to follow them again. Perhaps they spared me a darker fate. I do not know. I think it's best to leave them to the library's own intentions, whatever those may be. Rule 7. Know your enemy. This page was torn in half, leaving only the title. Apologies. Rule 8. Survive. On the eve of regret, as we know it now, I witnessed firsthand Aurora's way forced open, her visage befouled by the stitched hands of evil. I could have fought, clawed my way through the hordes, let loose my rage on the ones destroying my home until I was in pieces like Aurora before me. Instead, I slowed down, realized I would be more effective alive. And so I called for my allies to help seal the way, whilst I lead the invaders away from the library proper. Only then did we fight. My point is thus, defend yourself, but do not take this as an opportunity to crusade against the enemy. Save your strength. It will have far more use united than alone. I understand the urge for vengeance, but you must understand, too, that their flames do not merely destroy the physical. As we burn, our cultures burn with us. A way of life cannot be replicated once it is erased. Yet, the library shall rebuild itself, regardless of if we are here to see the shelves rise from the ashes. In the end, the library remains. We must do our best to follow its lead. That is not to say we cannot blame the ones responsible. Us survivors cannot hide forever. If you are reading this book, you will understand whether you are a wanderer or a trespasser, the former shall rise against the smoke to face the flames as one. Whilst the latter, you insignificant fools who stand before the cornucopia and think of nothing but greed, you who deserve not the demonization we have granted you, shall wither into the echoes of history remembered only by the scars we permit to remain. You fiends who read this and laugh at its message, fear us. Do not be fooled. The above rules are targeted at those who cannot fight, those who do not know the magic capable of expelling you and your kin. As I speak, your efforts are being dismantled, your friends erased without your knowledge, and soon, you. And not merely them. The library has its own enemies, its true enemies, long before you interlopers arrived. It is not my claws which descend from the rafters, nor is it my teeth that emerge from between the pages of a book. It is not my ears that hear the beautiful call of the siren shelves only to be seized by wooden arms. It is not my knees that fall to the floor, my throat slit, alone. And those of us who cannot fight, 
crouching in the darkness, hiding beneath the stacks, will wait, are waiting, for our time. We shall not merely wander into ruin, as our title suggests. We shall walk together into the unknown, into uncertainty. The library will be here when we return. The Field of Strange Ships by Ace Mallard. Most others do not visit. It is no longer forbidden, but those in the village have good reason to stay away. But I visit. There are wide fields, a flat valley near Grandfather Mountain. A long time ago it bloomed with tall grass and wild flowers, and many farmers made a living there, before flooding pushed them near the river. This was many generations ago. For all of my life, the fields have been bare dirt. I remember as a young girl taking walks with my father from the basin to the field. We often talked as I loved his stories of times past, of how much things had changed and how much they had stayed the same. When he had the energy, we would play with a sheepskin ball he had fashioned, throwing it back and forth, seeing how far we could go. As I grew older, he began telling me important things, about how my mother had died giving birth to my younger brother or how the village council took bribes from the interdimensional caravans which visited occasionally. This last one he told me could only be spoken out here, in the field. My father did not live much longer. He fell off a stone path while delivering supplies to the satellite array up in the hills. We found his mutilated body and gave him a proper burial. I was 11. When I was 12, the ships began appearing. My brother was the first to notice, as we carried fresh fruit from the market, he glanced off in the distance. Look, Nella, there's something there, something big! I looked. A bright glint could be seen from the field. What is that? We set down our supplies to gaze at it for a bit. It was very large, but not tall at all. It stretched out from edge to edge, but did not resemble a dish. It had an unusual shape that we could not make out clearly. We were only confident it was metallic. After gathering some other villagers, we traveled towards the field. None of us knew what to expect. A few brought hunting axes. We all walked in silence as the ship grew in size the closer we got. Finally, we stood adjacent to it. It was immense, a smooth yet hewn hulk of metal blocking the sun as resistant to our tools as the mountain. One portion, cleanly mirrored along both sides, were outstretched like great canopies of metal, suspended far above reach. When walking under its belly, the noon sun appeared like it were dusk. Along its long edge, it must have been four houses in span, it stood indomitable and unmoving. It dwarfed the largest structure in our village, by far. It had a few strange protrusions at strange angles, making it appear almost flat. Smooth metal covered all of its surfaces, save some small areas near its rear. It was covered in strange markings. The priestess said it was unlike any script they had ever seen. That night, there was brief discussion. The town seemed wary, but also enticed. The next day, the interdimensional trading caravan arrived, more than two moons ahead of schedule. They told us that a strange attractor could be seen on their wayfinding maps and had come to see what was causing the disruption. We quickly brought them to the fields. There was a second ship. It was much smaller than the first, but every bit is unmovable. Its metal could not be dented, and despite being lower to the ground, it still imposed on those who dared to walk near it. A similar sequence of markings were seen, though not quite the same. The traders seemed fascinated, saying that the dim routes were far better because of its presence and even promised an improved schedule. The village was uneasy. Many moons passed, and with it grew a slow feeling of acceptance towards these unusual new fixtures. The village council said the ships brought good luck. The traders came with more and more new goods, an unusually soft, thick black material, a wider variety of enchanted woods, and my favorite, a golden tubular fruit. Rumors spread about Mahek, the council elder, visiting the ships late at night. The fortune did not last long. One morning, 
A thin pool of black liquid covered the path towards the bell shrine, a place where the children often play. It had an entrancing quality. Little swirls of rainbow appeared as it flowed. The children were found splashing it about themselves, staining their clothes, face, and tongues, all while giggling. Their laughing began to change into crying as they fell ill. The priestess was called and they immediately identified the fluid as a cursed substance. What it was, they could not say. But they called for the able-bodied women of the village to don thick sheepskin and gathered into temple vessels for safe storage. Soon after, the rice patties became coated in it as well. We cleaned it and also discarded the stained plants as a precaution. That evening, the village gathered around the central fire. There was anger and fear as rumors and shouting and discussion of evil spirits came hurling out. Most were fearful. Some argued this was all coincidence. Two men got into a fight and were sent home. I sat quietly and listened. Over the next moon, eleven more ships appeared. Four were identical. Some farmers reported trees growing thin vermilion mold among its higher leaves, and dead flowers littered our dirt roads. It was at this point the priestess intervened. They prophesied that things would get worse for as long as the worship of the cursed ships continued. Many murmured at this, especially the wealthier members in the council. Some frowned, annoyed that the rumors were confirmed only now. But as the priestly word could not be easily overturned, soon the fields were warded and access was restricted. Children and elders continued to become sick, but it was manageable. Trade declined, or at least returned to previous levels. The Wayfinder has been marked, cautioning travelers to avoid the fields. I still miss the variety of goods. Sometime later, Mahek was exiled. It took nearly a year to choose a replacement elder. I still visit the fields. I walk among the ships thinking of my childhood, my community, my family. Sometimes I go in quiet joy, more often I go in mourning. There are many more ships now, some far larger than the rest. Somehow, they are as clear as the first day we laid eyes on them. There has been some talk of moving our settlement beyond the Grey River, but I do not fear the ships. Instead, I am drawn to them. They have a kind of terrible beauty. They stand tall unmoving, and carry with them a mysterious danger. I walk in their shade on hot days, but most of all, I visit to feel small. And that's all I have for you today. Come, you look. What's the word? Ah, sleepy. Have my stories bored you such? No, no, I just... It's quite alright. You little things need your rest. Hop off, this is the place. Wonderful, isn't it? A nice little nest to cozy up in. Go on and drift off. When you wake up, you'll be able to find your way back to the main hall. Just pick a direction and start walking. Until then, good night, wanderer. Restful dreams.